We still must isolate, even if they have been vaccinated. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Well, uh, dealing with this pandemic has been uh, a case of dealing with uh, uncertainty uh, in large degree. And today we have more certainty because we know that this vaccine is safe and effective. But just as I was saying to the uh, honourable member opposite that we don't know the effect of the vaccine on transmission, so we, as my right honourable friend says, don't, we don't know the effect of the vaccine um, in terms of its longevity, how long it will be effective for. Um, he's quite right about another part of uh, public health advice that we can all play a part in as local representatives, and that is the engagement with, uh, with contact tracing. Um, I, will, uh, I will write to him on the point about the access to daily data in Essex. Of course, we have to, we have to wait until the test result comes in, which can sometimes lead to a delay, even though, the, um, even though now the majority of tests that are done in person do come back within 24 hours uh, but I agree with him in principle and let's make that reality in practice. Let's head up to Scotland with SNP spokesperson Dr Philippa Whitford. Dr Whitford. Thank you very much Mr Speaker. As chair of the all party group on vaccination I absolutely welcome the authorisation of the Pfizer vaccine and would echo the shadow secretary's call for a public health campaign to encourage uptake. It will naturally take some time before it's widely available, so we all still need to stick to the rules and ensure we can test, trace, isolate and support all those carrying the virus. Last week, the Secretary of State claimed the pilot project of mass testing in Liverpool was responsible for driving down cases, despite the city having been under lockdown for much of the time. Lateral flow tests miss up to 40% of cases so the government's plan to use them to free people from isolation are causing concern among many public health and screening experts. So when will the formal assessment of the pilot be published? And how can he justify already putting out tenders for 40 billion pounds of contracts to extend this approach without scientific evaluation? Would it not be better to invest some of this money in getting the traditional test, trace and isolate system working properly. As six months on, the CERCO and CITEL system has still not improved and over 40% of contacts in England are still not being informed they should be isolating. He doesn't often talk about it, but he knows it's not testing, but isolation which actually stops the spread of the virus. So if people who are carrying the virus are not isolating, no amount of mass testing will stop its spread. When I raised the King's College report last week that less than 20% of cases and only 10% of contacts were isolating, the Secretary of State claimed the government has data showing much higher compliance. So can he tell us the figures for isolation rates for those with COVID and their contacts? People won't stay off work if it means they can't feed their family. So is he concerned at reports that many requests for the isolation payment are being refused? And how will he ensure that those carrying the virus are financially supported to isolate and reduce its spread? Hey, uh, thanks very much. Well, um, the, uh, the Honourable Lady uh, says that I don't talk about contact tracing very much. I was just I was literally answering a question on contact tracing and the previous uh, intervention, uh, Mr Speaker. I talk of little else. Um, the, um, uh, she asks also about the questions. She'll, uh, we are publishing further uh, data tomorrow on contact tracing, uh, precisely in response to the question uh, that she asks. And uh, she'll see that the continued improvement of our contact tracing uh, across uh, the country uh, is, um, uh, is advancing further. And we'll see that in the. Uh, uh, I can't say any more than that because the figures aren't released until. Uh, tomorrow, she asked about scientific evaluation. Um, absolutely, we're constantly scientifically evaluating the work that's going on, uh, especially in Liverpool. Uh, that's one of the things that the scientists who work as part of my team and who work in NHS Test and Trace and work in Public Health England, that's one of the things they do. It's a matter of constant scientific evaluation. But what we won't do is, is, is 
wait ages after something has finished to, to then do a, uh, an overly long uh, evaluation. What we do is we have to evaluate as we're going along and we have to do that because we're constantly trying to improve the response to this, uh, to this uh, pandemic and we're constantly trying to learn. And I would urge her to support the approach of constant learning and constant improvement. We're gonna to have to do that through the rollout of the vaccine too. She shakes her head, but that's how you have to deal with a pandemic in practice. Chair of the Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt. Mr Speaker, this is a huge personal triumph for the Health Secretary who has always backed the science. And in choosing uh, and backing on behalf of the country the first vaccine to prove efficacious, he has scored a massive goal for the country. He deserves great credit for that. And it will also have global significance. I was in a meeting with the World Health Organization this morning who congratulated the UK on being the first country to approve a vaccine because it will help encourage other countries around the world to approve vaccines faster. I want to ask him if I may uh, about something different, which is the plight of people with learning disabilities. He will know that Public Health England say that they are two to four times more likely to die from COVID. And the news that he's given this morning about people in care homes is tremendously welcome. But people with learning disabilities often feel that they are forgotten, particularly if they're in supported accommodation. And I wonder whether he could redouble his efforts to make sure that they too are able to be reunited with their families ahead of Christmas. Well, my right honourable friend is, is gracious and kind in what he says. Um, and I welcome the comments from the World Health Organization this morning, uh, who've supported the UK approach. Uh, and commended, rightly, the MHRA, our independent regulator, who have followed all of the same steps that any regulator, any high-quality regulator, would and should and will. But what they've done is done them rapidly and sometimes in parallel instead of one after the other. And that's how we've got to the position of being the first country in the world to have a vaccine that is clinically authorised. It's because the MHRA has done a brilliant job working with Pfizer and BioNTech to make sure the same safety uh, considerations are looked at but they're looked at in a way that essentially made the process as fast as is feasibly and safely uh, possible. And the WHO has backed that approach. Uh, and I think regulators around the world could take a look at the MHRA uh, and we should all congratulate them. Uh, he rightly asks about making sure that we vaccinate uh, the, those with uh, learning disabilities and offer them uh, vaccination at the right point in the prioritisation. This is an important consideration that I've discussed directly with the JCVI, who take into account the higher mortality of those with any given condition and have done that within the prioritisation that they set out this morning. Um, age is the single biggest determinant of uh, mortality from coronavirus. That's why age is the predominant factor in the prioritisation, but it's not the only factor. Uh, and so that has been considered by the JCVI, and I think it's very important that we accept and follow the JCVI advice as much as is practicable uh, in the delivery and deployment of this vaccine. Minera Wilson. Madam Deputy Speaker, and it is indeed a fantastic day. And could I add my thanks and congratulations to everybody who's been involved in getting us to this point, not just in the UK, but worldwide, because this is a great example of global scientific collaboration. Could I pick up uh, the point about batch testing? The Secretary of State mentioned it on the radio this morning and in his statement. Could he clarify that if we signed up to a mutual recognition agreement uh, with the EU, then we wouldn't need to batch test the vaccine again once it arrives in the UK, which could perhaps slow down the process, not least because um, in, in terms of having enough uh, qualified persons who can do the batch release testing could be a real challenge. So is he working on a mutual recognition agreement? Uh, thank you very much. Well, we have that mutual recognition agreement in place uh, now. And she's right to point to the global scientific work. You know, work between um, uh, UK scientists and scientists based in the UK, uh, of course German scientists uh, at uh, BioNTech, uh, the American scientists and the Belgians uh, who are producing and manufacturing uh, this vaccine. It is, a, it is, a, it is a, um, an approach uh, that has been 
about people coming together right around the world and the UK has put more into the global search for a vaccine uh, in cash terms than any other country. Uh, despite our uh, medium size as a nation, uh, we have been the most generous uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm really proud of that. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's great news about the vaccine and, and on behalf of the residents of Ashford and Eastwood, a big thanks to the health secretary, the scientists and the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies. The small businesses in Ashfield and Eastwood have taken a massive financial hit during lockdown, despite doing their very best to be COVID secure. Meanwhile, supermarkets have recorded record profits. I've received lots of complaints this week from customers and staff at local supermarkets who say the stores are overcrowded and not COVID safe. And this is happening all over the country and is unfair to the small businesses who have been hit the hardest. So whilst the UK is being vaccinated, in the run-up to Christmas, traders in my constituency will do their very best to beat the virus. So could my right honourable friend please remind the supermarket executives that they have a duty to protect their staff, customers, our NHS and the whole of the UK in order to beat the virus and get our lives back. Uh, yes, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm very happy to uh, remind from this dispatch box the, the supermarkets of their responsibilities uh, to follow COVID secure guidelines and ensure they're in place for their customers and their staff. Uh, and I also want to pay tribute to the honourable gentleman for standing up for the small businesses of Ashfield. It is tough in Ashfield at the moment, I get that. We have the restrictions in place only because they are absolutely necessary. Uh, and I know that he understands that and he's a strong voice for the small businesses of Ashfield and indeed uh, all the residents of Ashfield uh, in this chamber. Jim Shannon. Thanks, Speaker. Can I also, uh, uh, what a joy it was to see in the news at seven o'clock this morning, the, the news being broken and see the, the Secretary of State as well. I'd like to put on record my thanks to the Secretary of State and all his team for making this happen and thank you. Um, is the Secretary of State aware that there are still those who are unable to uh, access their flu vaccine? Uh, what steps have been taken to ensure that the flu vaccine rollout is completed before the corona programme begins? And what discussions has the Secretary of State had with the Northern Ireland Assembly to provide vaccines and, more importantly, the rollout for our vulnerable and frontline key workers? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his kind words. And it has been a big team effort. Um, and um, I, I, I echo his uh, thanks to the whole team. On the flu vaccine, uh, we have a further uh, tranche of flu vaccine ready to go. Uh, and that's just about to be rolled out. Uh, making sure that we get flu vaccine available right across the UK is very important. It's an issue that Robin Swan, my opposite number uh, in the uh, Northern Ireland administration, uh, has and I have worked on uh, extensively, uh, and he is uh, incredibly uh, diligent in ensuring that we get the flu vaccine uh, rolled out to the uh, uh, to uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and um, there is an interaction between, of course, the massive flu vaccine rollout programme, which the NHS does every year, but this year is bigger than ever, um, and at the same time having to do a, a COVID vaccine rollout. We've taken that into account uh, in the plans. And in fact, I was, before the announcement at 6.30 this morning, I was talking to uh, Robin Swan on the phone, which shows how hardworking he is. Raymond Chisley. Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank the Secretary of State for all his hard work and congratulate him, the government and all the scientists on the approval of the vaccine. The Secretary of State will know that Medway and neighbouring Swell, both of which are served by Medway Hospital in my constituency, are currently recording the first and the second highest COVID rates in the country. And parts of Gillingham are recording rates as high as 753 per 100,000 people. I thank the Secretary of State for listening to representations from my local authority and myself and other local MPs for providing military aid assistance on rapid testing to Medway. The Secretary of State also knows Medway has some of the highest health inequalities in the country and health inequalities are linked to high rates. Will you join me and pay tribute to the fantastic work of the hospital and its staff in helping local residents? Yes, yes, I will, Madam Deputy Speaker. And um, we, there is a very significant problem with the, the epidemic in Medway and North Kent. Uh, and I know that my honourable friend uh, is uh, very concerned about this. Uh, I pay tribute to those working on the front line at Medway Hospital, which is one of the most pressured hospitals in the country at the moment. 
uh, and also thank other parts of Kent and other trusts across Kent for providing uh, mutual aid. We've got to get this virus under control in Medway and across North uh, Kent. The way to do that is for everybody to abide by the Tier 3 restrictions uh, and to do everything they can to ensure they don't pass on the disease. Uh, and then we can get these cases coming down. Um, we are also, at the same time, going to inject uh, a huge number of tests into Medway. We're working closely with Medway Council on this, uh, and we will be using the armed forces uh, to help make it happen, because we've got to get this virus under control in Medway. Tracy Braben. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I add my thanks as well to the scientists, but also to the volunteers who put their own health at risk so that we could beat this pandemic. Um, in my constituency, we've been under quite enhanced restrictions for many, many months now. And uh, we've worked with, the community has worked with the councils and others. And finally, we've had a drop in uh, infections of 41% in the last week. But we need to go further to get out of restrictions. And part of that is mass testing. So can the minister clarify the, uh, my understanding that mass testing, uh, you get £14 per person per head. Um, for mass testing, but you don't get those boots on the ground from the army. You get logistical advice and support and not physical help. We can't do mass testing on the cheap. So can the minister confirm that he will give the resources to the councils? And is mass testing going to roll out before February 2021? Oh, yes. Um, and Madam Deputy Speaker, mass testing is rolling out as we speak. Uh, and uh, the, my team have uh, been working with Kirklees Council uh, to make sure that, that their enthusiasm for mass testing is matched by the resources that come their way, both in terms of the tests themselves and in terms of the financial support, as she says, £14 per test, uh, and, um, of, and the logistical support from the armed forces. Uh, so we are, I, I think that uh, Kirklees' plans are, are very advanced. Uh, I pay tribute to their leadership and look forward to working with them to make it happen. Um, order... I do want to be able to get everybody in, but we are getting a little behind schedule. Um, so I would ask for succinct questions. Thank you. Gogo Mahindra. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I firstly congratulate the Secretary of State and our government for the brilliant work they've done in making sure that we were the first country in the world to have a vaccination approved. Um, I think it's worth repeating, uh, Secretary of State, if you may, um, the criteria and the pecking order to do with the 800,000 doses uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Councillor Bentley, always says people need to hear things at least eight times before they embed it. So can you uh, take this opportunity to do so? Yes, absolutely. Look, we will follow a clinical prioritisation according to need, and that starts with those who are resident in care homes and their carers and the over 80s and NHS staff, and then essentially comes down the age range, including those who are clinically extremely vulnerable. We know, we know, sadly, um, through the experience of the last nine months, ten months, um, who is most likely to die of COVID? And they're the people who we'll try to get to first. Stephen Doughty. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, this is hugely welcome news. And can I also pay tribute, as well as to the scientists, to all the teams in our local health boards um, who are preparing to deliver this vaccine, in particular Cardiff and Vale Health Board, Fiona Kinghorn and her team, and the armed forces who have been involved in this process as well. They've absolutely done an incredible job over the last few weeks to be ready for this delivery. But the Secretary of State said, crucially, this is a UK-wide effort. Um, can he give that cast iron guarantee that this tranche of vaccines, but also future tranches, will be available on a completely equitable basis across the United Kingdom so we can bear down this virus in every part of our country. Yes, I can give that assurance. And can I join him in thanking the volunteers, uh, who I uh, should have thanked in response to an earlier question, and also thank in advance everybody in the NHS who's going to be involved in this rollout. It's going to be a mammoth effort. People are going to be working uh, really hard this winter when people already work hard during winter in the NHS and I'm sure that the whole house is very grateful to them. Greg Clark. Thank you very much. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I join the Secretary of State in thanking the, the, for the brilliance and hard work of the scientists that were involved in this major breakthrough and can I join my right honourable friend in paying a personal tribute to the Secretary of State who has been tenacious, positive and energetic right throughout this. Yeah. And 
the fact that we're the first in the world, is, a lot of that is down to him. Here, here. We need to keep the virus uh, suppressed during the, the months ahead. Um, and one of the problems with test and trace uh, is that quite often people don't disclose all of their contacts because they don't want them to have to isolate for two weeks. Now, Sir John Bell, whom I know the Secretary of State admires as much as I do, he suggests that if we uh, subject people who are isolated to two tests, and if they're both negative, they should be released, he thinks that will safely uh, encourage people to share their contacts and suppress the spread of the, the virus. He's moved heaven and earth uh, on vaccination. Will he do this for test and release? Well, it's a great day for science, and it's a great day to be chair of the Science Committee, I would have thought. Um, and um, I'm grateful to what my right honourable friend said, which was very generous. Um, on the point about repeat testing instead of isolation for contacts, that is something that we're trialling uh, right now, uh, and um, I hope that we can make significant progress on it in the weeks ahead. We now go to Geraint Davis. Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you. Last Tuesday, the Prime Minister reassured me that government, government guidance would stop non-essential travel out of areas in Tier 2 or Tier 3 into less infected areas. However, the guidance, in fact, says that if you live in Tier 2 areas, you must continue to follow the Tier 2 rules when you travel to Tier 1 areas, which means you can travel from higher to lower infection areas, including to Wales. So will the Health Secretary update the guidance to comply with the Prime Minister's advice to stop non-essential travel from higher to lower infected areas ahead of the vaccine? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the guidance is precisely as set out on gov.uk. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I place on record my thanks to Kate Bingham and the Vaccines Task Force, as well as all government departments that have played their part in this welcome announcement, particularly that of my right honourable friend. Does my right honourable friend agree that as community testing and vaccines are rolled out throughout the winter and into the spring, the need for even localised restrictions will gradually reduce mm -hmm. and life can begin to something closer to normality for my constituents in Workington. Yes. I've got good news for the people of Workington and the whole country, which is that uh, suppressing the virus using these restrictions until a vaccine came along has been the strategy all along, and we can just start to see that light at the end of the tunnel much brighter, because we know we've now got a vaccine. Flair Anderson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I also welcome this news and thank all the scientists involved in this great breakthrough. And when it's my turn to take, have a vaccine, I will have absolutely no hesitation yeah. Yeah. in doing so. And, and when it comes to terms, can the Secretary of State confirm that community workers, care workers that work in the community, who work home for home, will be part of the first assessment of clinical need? And then after clinical need, will educational need be a factor in keeping our schools open? A school in Southfield has been closed for the last two weeks for lack of teachers being able to teach. So the, uh, as a next phase, will educational need be a consideration for the rollout of the vaccine? Well, once we've got through the clinical priority, then of course there's a, a, a debate to be had about the next order of priority after that. Um, and, um, but in the, it, between now and then, I hope that the repeat testing of contacts uh, will, uh, if we can get that up and running and working uh, across the board, I hope that that will be effective in ensuring that fewer teachers have to isolate because they're contacts as opposed to positive cases. Now go to Mary Robinson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I congratulate my right honourable friend for securing this vaccine and his amazing success in preparing us for its speedy rollout. This is indeed a good news day. And the news that hospital staff, care workers and patients will be among the first to receive it will be welcomed in my local hospital and across our care sector, and we're keen to make a start. Meanwhile, as the vaccine rolls out to other groups, would my right honourable friend consider introducing rapid targeted testing at scale in Stockport and across Greater Manchester as we continue to drive down our COVID rates and work together to beat this virus? Uh, yes, yes, I will. Let's work together and make that happen with, uh, with Stockport Council as well uh, and try to get those rates right down even further than they already are. We now go to Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I echo the congratulations to all involved with the good news about this vaccination. 
Last week, I asked the Secretary of State to publish the modelling he has on the effect of relaxing the rules over Christmas on transmission of COVID-19. Yesterday, I was told that it was not possible to answer yet. Now that seems quite extraordinary. Has the Secretary of State been given an estimate of how many additional deaths are likely to be caused by the loosening of restrictions over Christmas? If he knows the answer, I ask if he could tell us that now. And if he doesn't know the answer, why would he be making such a major decision without any idea of the number of deaths that could result? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. We, we have to make judgments based on uh, what is right uh, and balancing the different considerations that you have to take into account, including the yearning that many, many people have to come together at Christmas and try to find a balanced way through. We did that working with the devolved authorities, and I'm very glad that we came to a UK-wide uh, approach to, uh, to Christmas, taking into account all the considerations that were necessary. Greg Smith. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I add my voice of congratulation to my right honourable friend, the scientists, the pharmaceutical companies, and everybody involved in today's good news of securing that vaccine. But my right honourable friend will know my deep reservations on the severity of the restrictions being placed through the new tier system on my constituents, and I'm grateful for the time he took to discuss this with me yesterday. And a big part of my reluctant decision to vote with the government last night was the promise of more granularity when it comes to the review on the 16th of December. Can he therefore confirm that the Buckingham constituency can be considered if the numbers continue to come down to be in Tier 1 before Christmas? Uh, yes, I enjoyed the conversations that I had with my honourable friend uh, in, on the approach to the division lobby, and I, uh, and I can confirm the answer to his question is yes. Rachel Maskell. Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker, I also congratulate the scientific yeah. community on their achievements today. But will the Secretary of State look with precision at the York model yeah. of delivering contact tracing? Mm. It's been a phenomenal story yeah, yeah, where yeah. precision contact tracing interviews has reduced that rate right down. They need the information on day one, not after 48 hours, which is being held back, but they also need to ensure that they get payments and support for people isolating. It works. So will the Secretary of State now follow that model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not only follow the model, uh, we'll promote it. The link between the local authority and the national system in York has indeed had the effect that she uh, rightly describes, uh, and the teamwork between the two has meant, I was looking at the figures this morning, that the figures in York are coming right down, pay tribute to everybody in York, and it's an example of the national and local systems working together. We've got to get the case rates right down all the way across North Yorkshire, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and indeed everywhere uh, in Yorkshire, and I'm sure that we can. Withdrawn, so straight to Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Barnsley has fewer GPs than areas down south, so can the Secretary of State explain his plan to make sure that places like my constituency are not left behind in the rollout of the vaccine? Yes, of course. Uh, GPs, uh, as well as pharmacists, and the hospital uh, hubs and the vaccination centres are the are, they are the three uh, routes. Uh, to getting a vaccine and we'll do it through the primary care networks which are groups of GPs and we'll make sure that it's equitable right across the country. It's so important not only between England and the devolved nations but within England having the rollout fair right across the land. Dr James Davis. Thank you Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, it certainly is extremely good news on the vaccination uh, announcement today. Um, my right honourable friend has already outlined that um, there will be equitable provision of the vaccine across the United Kingdom. Will he do the same for community mass testing? And will he outline the logistics involved in getting both the vaccines and those community uh, mass testing uh, kits to Wales? Thank you. Yes, as a, as a GP, my honourable friend understands this area uh, more than most. And we are working with the uh, Welsh administration uh, to try to get community testing throughout Wales. Uh, we're working in Merthyr Tydfil uh, right now to get the case rates down in, uh, in Merthyr. Uh, and I'm very happy to work with him and with the uh, Welsh administration and local councils uh, to try to make sure that we can get those case rates down wherever, wherever we can. Now go to Martin Day. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As we await the welcome rollout of a vaccine, test and trace remains vitally important. And in Scotland, over 90% of cases and contacts are being reached. Whereas in England, with reliance on CERCO, it has barely seen 60% of contacts reached, far lower than needed to meaningfully limit the spread of COVID. So can the Minister advise what clauses are within the contracts regarding this failure to deliver, and what is he going to do about it? I would just gently advise um, him and other SNP members uh, not to try to make this comparison, because um, I, I've looked into this in some detail when somebody else raised it, uh, and it turns out that it, the, uh, the figures are only comparable if you strip out finding the contacts in places where it's easy to get the contacts, the contacts like care homes, because everybody who lives there you can easily account for. Uh, and so comparing apples and pears like this is not uh, sensible, uh, it's not right, and trying to drive a wedge between the public and private elements of the provision of this system, which, by the way, they have in Scotland as well, I think that's a mistake. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I would also like to thank everyone involved in today's good news from North Devon. And my right honourable friend will know that the Nightingale in Exeter has now opened, um, but he will also know that we are seeing a large number of NHS staff absences across Devon. Can my right honourable friend assure me that the government is doing everything it can to keep staff safe and ensure we have enough staff to keep all hospitals in Devon running as they should? Yes, Madam Deputy Speaker, my honourable friend is quite right to raise this important issue. Um, and I'm glad to say that we have more staff working in the NHS in Devon over the last year, and we've increased the number of uh, nurses nationally by over 14,000. Uh, but there all are also those absent uh, because of COVID. I hope that regular testing will help to bring this number down. And then, of course, uh, there's the vaccine, which I hope will solve this problem once and for all. Ben Bradshaw. Much disappointment uh, in Devon that we were put in tier two, although our rates are only 80 per 100,000 and coming down. So can you spell out exactly what has to happen in Devon over the next two weeks for us to move into tier one? And if the success, the phenomenal success of the York model in virtually eradicating COVID in York is for the reasons he suggests, why isn't that being done elsewhere? Well, we're, we're, very, happy. Uh, we're very happy to work with Devon Council if, uh, if they want to come forward uh, for that sort of model. We're constantly learning from around the country and these, uh, the, the local national partnerships actually often bring lessons because people have chosen to do things slightly differently in a local area and we can all uh, learn from that. Um, the, what I'd say about Devon coming into Tier 1, uh, Devon, of course, it does have uh, lower rates than many places. It isn't the lowest area in Tier 2. Uh, that um, uh, that honour uh, belongs to my own county of Suffolk. Um, there are case, elevated numbers of cases in some parts of Devon, um, and what I would urge everybody in Devon to do to get into Tier 1 is to abide by the Tier 2 rules, and more than that, to take personal responsibility to do all they can to reduce the spread of the virus. Dr Andrew Morrison. Well done to everybody involved with this triumph. I share the Secretary of State's concern over vaccine hesitancy, and he's right to say that everyone in this House has a duty uh, to try to dispel it. Does he agree with me that had this House not taken the decision on the 16th of October to empower the nimble MHRA and leave regulation instead to the European Medicines Agency until the 31st of December, he would not be in the happy position that he's in today? Yes, I'm very glad that we changed the law to allow the MHRA to make this authorisation on uh, UK terms. Uh, they, this House voted unanimously to, uh, to do that. Well, we didn't even have a vote. Uh, it went through without one. Uh, and I'm really glad that we were able to do that. Uh, and I just want to thank my right honourable friend for his uh, support and encouragement throughout this. It's been a very, very long uh, year as Health Secretary, and I really appreciate his support. Toby Perkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Health Secretary spoke uh, about learning lessons and continuing to improve uh, the system. Uh, my partner's daughter has, uh, is currently self-isolating because someone in her class at school uh, has got coronavirus. She comes home and lives 
with her sister who was still expected to go to school. Um, surely a world-class testing system would be testing everyone in the bubble who's been sent home so that their uh, immediate family could be either identify that they have got the virus or uh, and take appropriate action or, or not. Is there any more that can be done to actually improve this so that uh, uh, people like my uh, partner and many other parents at Holly Side School will be able to uh, take the necessary steps? Yes. We're, pi we're piloting exactly that idea in, uh, I think, eight schools right now, uh, and I hope to be able to roll it out once we've learnt from those pilots. We now go to Carl McCartney. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And um, my right honourable friend will be aware that Lincoln has a high student population, something I am very proud of, and our two universities are highly regarded. Quite a number of constituents have, con have contacted me regarding the potential in increase in cases when students return in January. What steps is my right honourable friend taking to support universities with this, and what further steps can be taken to support students who have to isolate, as often they are far away from loved ones who can support them with shopping, etc. And as a government, we must do all we can to ensure education continues as normal. Yes, he's absolutely right. And um, just as where as students go home for Christmas, we're able to use the massive testing capacity that we've built up uh, to ensure that they can go home safely. So we propose to use testing to allow students to return safely. It's rather like the previous uh, answer I just gave about being able to use testing uh, instead of isolation in schools. Uh, but I would just say this uh, gently to the previous uh, speaker who, as he sat down, um, muttered uh, about this. It is far better to work together, and it's only because of the massive testing capacity that we have built up through the actions of this government that this is possible. We have the biggest testing capacity in Europe, and we can use it for keeping people safe in schools and for allowing people to safely go to and from uh, universities. And this is exactly the sort of empowerment uh, that we can, uh, we, can, we can get through the huge testing programme that we've now built. Liz Twist. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, last week we celebrated Carers' Rights Day, and today, with the priority list being issued by the uh, Joint Committee on, on Vaccines, uh, they're not included in that priority list. They do a huge job in looking after some of our more vulnerable people. Will you look again at that decision? Uh, I, I'm very happy to, uh, uh, to ensure that the JCVI take all the appropriate uh, uh, considerations into account. Um, however, it isn't my decision to look at again. My decision is that we should follow the clinical advice, uh, and I think we should respect the JCVI, who are uh, hugely expert uh, in, uh, in the clinical advice that they give. Jason McCartney. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, fantastic news about the vaccine, but we can't be complacent. The Kirklees Director of Public Health briefed me and other local MPs last night that Kirklees needs to be in Tier 3 right now. We were in the top five councils for COVID cases, but good local action combined with the national lockdown has helped reduce cases by 41%. Now, can the Health Secretary confirm that he will use localised data at the first review of the tiers on the 16th of December. So if we continue that progress, we might be able to come out of tier three. And in the meantime, will he also speak again to the Chancellor to see what extra financial support we can give to our pubs, restaurants and cafes at this challenging time? Yes, well, of course, the, the, uh, the Prime Minister announced uh, extra funding for wet pubs uh, yesterday. I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, a further uh, discussion o o on that matter, but I would also pay tribute to Kirklees, the people who, of Kirk, the people who live in Kirklees, uh, and my honourable friends' constituents, because it has been tough and it's been a long time, and these measures have been in place for longer than almost anywhere else in the country, and these rates are now really coming down, and uh, everybody should be very grateful for that. Kevin Jones. Speaker. The Secretary of State talks a lot about partnership at local level and two weeks ago uh, his department contacted uh, uh, the uh, uh, local uh, now public health uh, directors and asked them to draw up plans for uh, care home testing. Last week his department sent out a letter directly to care homes bypassing those local directors of public health. Uh, to introduce uh, testing at those uh, care homes. Can I ask why uh, the approach was changed? And also, can he explain how 
the testing that's going to take place in local care homes, the data that got from that, how is it going to be fed through to local directors of public health uh, to do uh, local test, uh, local tracing? Um, well, it is very important that that tracing happens and the, the uh, data, as he knows, uh, is fed through uh, to councils where that uh, data agreement has been uh, put in place. Uh, and I think, what, I think the best approach is for councils and the national system to work well together. Andrew Griffith. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And will the Health Secretary and his colleagues accept my congratulations on making sure that the UK is one of the first countries in the world to have a deployable vaccine? Would he agree with me that businesses and their employees in the UK pharmaceutical sector that invest over £4 billion a year of private risk capital are heroes every mit as much as our wonderful NHS employees on the front line? Absolutely, Absolutely Madam Deputy Speaker. And this, uh, the point that my honourable friend has made gives a lie to this idea that you should somehow split off public and private. I want to pay tribute on behalf of all those in this House who believe in private enterprise, for everybody, the major global pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer and AstraZeneca, uh, the small entrepreneurial startups by, like uh, BioNTech, um, and all those who have come to the aid of the nation. And if they do it and make a profit, if they, if they do that to save lives, that's fine by me. Yeah. Chris Bryant. Advent always starts with the prospect of good news, so this is a really good advent, says the former vicar, yes, quite. Um, the, can I just add one element to this uh, issue of the prioritisation of vaccination, however, which is that COVID has savagely exposed the health inequalities across the whole of the country. The poorest communities have suffered most, and um, the poorest communities often have the fewest health services and the least capacity, additional capacity, to be able to deliver vaccination. So as part of the mix, can we just make sure that equality, real equity across the whole of the country, means that the poorest communities may need additional support? Yes, uh, and the, the Honourable Gentleman um, raises a point that's important for the vaccination programme, but it's important thereafter. Because if levelling up means anything, it means trying to uh, level up health and make sure that the health inequalities of which he speaks are addressed. 34 withdrawn, so we go to Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I think everyone involved in delivering this great news is to be congratulated, including the Secretary of State. The First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has said that provided we receive the first doses of the vaccine as soon as we're expecting them in Scotland, we can start vaccinating people on Tuesday next week. Will he join in applauding all of NHS Scotland who are going to make this possible? Yes, I absolutely will, Madam Deputy Speaker. And our goal and our aim and the commitment and agreement between all four uh, nations of the United Kingdom is that we will all start vaccination at the same time, fairly, across uh, the four nations. That will happen early next week. Uh, the, the, when, we, when the announcement was made at 7am, the one remaining regulatory hurdle uh, was the batch testing. That has now been uh, completed. Uh, so we are on track uh, to deliver on that commitment, and it will be delivered through the NHS in all four corners of our, of our land, and we're working closely together. Uh, I, uh, I, I spoke to my opposite number in Scotland uh, early this morning to make sure that we were as coordinated as possible. And this UK purchased vaccine being delivered by NHS Scotland is a really good example of the power of this country when we all work together. To Alicia Cairns. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The first country in the world to have a vaccine, a world-class testing programme, what a phenomenal achievement. I'd like to thank my right honourable friend and all those scientists and clinicians who've made today a reality. I'm pleased that before Christmas, we should have vaccine centres established in Oakham and in Melton Mowbray in my constituency. So please will he join me in extending his thanks to my local councils, our clinicians and residents for their enormously hard work to get ready to bring this vaccine to my communities. Yes, I absolutely will. And I'll pay tribute to their work on preparing for the vaccine rollout. 
uh, and also their work in keeping the virus under control, uh, which is such an important task, so difficult, uh, and has consumed so much effort this year, yet there's still more work to be done over this winter to get the vaccine rolled out. Angela Eagle. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. Two injections per person for everyone in the country is going to take an awful long time. The Prime Minister was hoping it would be done by Easter. Does the Health Secretary share that timetable or will he publish another one? And is he planning on making this vaccine available again next year since we don't know how long immunity lasts and COVID is likely to be endemic and with us for some time to come? Yes, two incredibly important questions, the first of which the Honourable Gentleman on the front bench asked and I didn't answer, for which I apologise. Um, the speed at which we can continue this rollout uh, will de be determined by the speed at which Pfizer can manufacture um, and whether the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is approved by the MHRA, of which we have 100 million on order. So I'm afraid I can't answer her question on timetable or indeed the Honourable Gentleman's uh, because it is dependent on the approval of AstraZeneca and the manufacturing process of the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Um, on the um, second question uh, that she um, asks, um, I've completely forgotten what it was. Next year. Next year. Next year. Next year, yes. If this, if this vaccine is only uh, short term, one of the reasons that we have 357 million doses from seven different vaccines uh, is to be able to, uh, to vaccinate um, another further doses if that's needed in due course. And whether that's through a re-procurement of, uh, of one of the existing uh, vaccines or by switching to a different vaccine if that is clinically appropriate. That is absolutely part of the potential future plans that we have under consideration, but it's too early to know the answer to that question as well. Kevin Hollingrake. Thank you, Madam Mr. Speaker. And uh, wonderful news on the vaccine. Many congratulations to all involved, including the Secretary of State. But he will concede it will be some months before restrictions can be lifted. North Yorkshire is the largest county in England by miles. It takes three hours to drive from one side of it to the other side of it. Will he consider the, the variation in infection rates are considerable across the region? Will he consider when he moves uh, tiers around, perhaps in two weeks' time, moving one of the seven districts of North Yorkshire with low infection rates into tier one? Well, as the Prime Minister said yesterday, we do look at the human geography of these um, uh, of, and how the epidemiology uh, shows the spread of the, of the, uh, the virus uh, to be um, uh, occurring across, uh, across the country, including especially across the big uh, rural uh, counties, but not limited to, uh, to that. Um, we've got to be slightly careful in, in North Yorkshire. Uh, one of the challenged areas is Scarborough, where the case rates are elevated. I appreciate that is a long way from uh, from my honourable friends patch, uh, but it is uh, so we do look at it uh, at that granular level and make decisions on that basis. But the decision to put the whole of North Yorkshire into tier two was taken actually looking at each part of North Yorkshire and uh, 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 and on its merits in each part. We now go to Margaret Greenwood. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Dr De Grucci, the president of the Association of Directors of Public Health, has said that it is completely incomprehensible that the government is not increasing the public health grant to local authorities for next year. She spoke of the importance of learning the lessons of how existing health inequalities have driven and exacerbated the impact of COVID-19, addressing the socioeconomic determinants of health and giving public health teams the resources that they need to both continue the fight against COVID-19 and the longer term. So will the Secretary of State pay heed to this message and will he call on the Chancellor to give local public health teams the funding that they need? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are increasing the public health grant uh, next year and also the public health grant is but one part of the massive, massive overall investment in public health that we've made uh, this year and that we will of course have to continue to make, make next year as we get this virus under control. Last question, Sarah Brickley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The news this morning about the vaccines gives my constituents of Hyman and Haslingdon 
that light at the end of a very dark, dark tunnel. And the announcement on care homes is genuinely brilliant news and is something that I've pushed for as a Secretary of State will know, both in and out of this chamber. But as has been mentioned, mass testing is also a vital part in our fight against coronavirus. So can the Secretary of State confirm when this will be rolled out in tier three areas such as Hindburn and Haslingden so that we can continue to get our rate down and get our brilliant hospitality sector off again? My honourable friend is right. Uh, the candle of hope is burning brighter today. And uh, on the mass testing that she is so enthusiastic about, I can tell her that this morning, when I asked my officials to ensure that the community testing programme that's being developed for Heimburn uh, is advanced as quickly as possible, they told me uh, that they had been, uh, they'd been told of the need for this by so many people, and so many people had been lobbied by the Honourable Lady, uh, that it was already in hand. And I, I suppose, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that goes to show, and uh, that goes to show just how uh, vociferous my honourable friend is in fighting for the people of Heimburg. <laughs> Order. Thank you. Um, three minutes suspension.